So, after we've seen quite a few uh, Italian horror and exploitation films, I think it's time to mix things up and get back to the other thing that this label seems to do best. Maleni Trash. And what better way to do that than with this thing. Rain in Darkness. This is a 2002 Australian action horror film directed by David W. Allen and Kelly Dolan, who, looking at their filmography, they haven't really done much of anything. Looks like they worked together with some of the cast from this on a Star Wars fan film called Star Wars Wrath of the Mandalorian. It's not got very good reviews, though. The only person really of note to come from this is a fella called David No, who it looks like went on to become somewhat of a successful stuntsman. Uh, it was in the newest Dune, um, The Matrix Reloaded, and the Barbie movie, so seems to be doing alright for himself. Looking like a bootleg version of The Crow, crossed with Blade and with a smattering of The Matrix, let's see if this film is half as angsty as the cover makes it out to be. Well, is it ready yet? Yeah, it's ready. Well, let's get to it. Okay, then. Sweet Jesus, boy, what the hell are you doing? He's getting away! The plot follows Michael, a microbiologist working for a large company trying to find a cure to the HIV virus. But he accidentally gets injected with his own vaccine that's untested and it turns him into a vampire. So now he's on the run from a mysterious group called the Council, a hitman called Lance, and some sort of ex-test subject slash half vampire Gage. Yeah, but you know what? This actually has somewhat of a story that it's trying to tell. There's more plot in this than half of the hardcore stuff that we've looked at recently. For the most part, it maintains an entertaining pace, dipping every now and then. Unfortunately though, it does end in a seven minute long summing up monologue. Managing somehow to touch on HIV and global warming, don't know how it manages that. It's not a good film, but you know what? I had a hell of a lot of fun watching it. Who are you? Yeah! Uh, not who, Michael. But what? Help. Who are you working for? Who's behind all of this? The government. I don't know who. I just take orders like you did. How can you... The acting is that perfect balance between terrible and hilarious. Most of the cast are Australian, and they're all insisting on doing these different accents, ranging from American to Cockney, and none of them are convincing. The acting in general is just not good either. People are slurring the words and stumbling over the lines, and there's just some really bad dialogue in this. It's pretty entertaining, to be honest, especially Michael, who I was laughing at quite a bit because sometimes he can barely string a sentence together, and then they give him these big daft contact lenses when he's all vamped up, and it just comes across as bizarre. There's not much gore in this, there's bits, uh, it's not great, uh, there's a lot of CG blood knocking about which doesn't look fantastic, it's very cheap looking, and there's a lot of after the fact wounds, we don't see the gore happening, we just see the aftermath, which, nah, not great. There's also no nudity in this, which is a is a big change from what we're used to recently. A lot of these films have been very sleazy we've been covering, but this one, not at all really, unless you count a lot of shirtless dudes. There is just this sort of element of homoeroticism in the background, which is quite fun. The effects aren't great either. There's CG explosions, as I said, CG blood, visible like stunt cables, and really, really naff looking muzzle flashes. It's all very of the era. Same could be said for the sets as well. Most of this film takes place in nondescript abandoned warehouses. It's a style I quite like, but you can tell that it was done on the cheap. Also, this film's called Rain in Darkness, but most of it is shot in broad daylight. Seems a bit daft. I was a bit disappointed with the music as well. Looking at the cover for this, I expected there to be some really angsty knockoff like metal music in it. 
thinking like a like a discount Marilyn Manson sort of thing. We're gonna get one instance of this, unfortunately, and the rest of it is taken up with like an electronic beat or just general ambience. Eh. Maybe I'm sick of playing by your rules. That son of a bitch crippled me. Now you want me to leave him alone? Enough! We understand you wish to acquire some of our merchandise. That's right. All right, that's enough of the bullshit, sunshine. This is a prime example of Millenni Trash. Let's look at its symptoms, shall we? Costume, everyone's either in shades and a black leather trench coat or a black suit. There's a blue tint to some of the flashback sequences, angsty narration, helicopter shots, an electronic soundtrack, rapid, insane editing, uh, big daft guns blasting off everywhere, and this just this general macho edginess that's also sort of drenched in this unintentionally campiness. Uh, there's probably more examples, but these are some of the things that I picked up on that really make it scream Millenni Trash to me and really defined that era for low budget filmmaking. There's a scene as well where Michael blows up a building with a Nokia 8810 and I was very happy to see that. It's a great bit. I also mentioned earlier on that this film borrows a lot and is clearly influenced a lot by other films of a similar genre of the era. Let's have a little look at the films and let's see what the similarities are, shall we? So The Crow, uh, straight away the setting and the revenge story plot. It, 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 has a, it has a feel, it has an angsty feel to it. Uh, the Matrix for the costume which we mentioned, you know, the shades and the trench coats and stuff. And also some of the colour tinting is very, very Matrix-like. And of course, Blade. This film's about vampires, there's action scenes, there's sword fights. Very much so re influenced by Blade, you can see. Not though, Underworld. Apparently, well, it's definitely got nothing to do with Underworld, because Underworld came out a whole year after this, so maybe Underworld was influenced by this. Because I thought, when I saw this, first thought, that looks like an Underworld knockoff, but no, this came a year before it, so there you go. Um, you take all these elements though, and then you remove the budget, you give the director a crappy DV camcorder, and then you get amateur actors together, and this is the end product, really. Okay, time for the print, and it's not great. The good though is the you know the contrast and the colours aren't too bad, and there aren't really any imperfections with this being shot on digital. It doesn't have like film grain or anything like that. But it is really low quality. It's pixelated and there's artifacting, and there's a really annoying green line along the bottom of the screen and blue line down the right hand side of the screen really distracting, really annoying, and what was worse was when the blue line disappeared briefly for like a few scenes and then came back. It's one of those where you can sort of tune it out, but it, it's just annoying enough that it, it's not it's not a good look, let's say. Outside of that though, outside of the bad print, there aren't any major hiccups really, there's no like big daft tears or sound spike or anything like that. The sound's not too bad either to be honest. It's watchable but it's very low quality. And on the disc we get chapter select, a trailer for this film and a selection of hardcore trailers. 
that's your lot. Really, really bare bones release this time. Okay, time for the case. Uh, the description's fine, it reads well, there's no errors. The main issue is that font, which is barely readable, it just looks terrible. The runtime's correct this time too, which is nice. And lastly, just look at this cover. It's so of its time, I love it. Overall then, this is not a good film. The acting's terrible and it's got a sometimes meandering pace. But you know what? I had a hell of a lot of fun watching it. I laughed a lot and it's a great example of Maleni trash. I wouldn't recommend this for solo or sober viewing, but get some booze, some friends or family, someone will appreciate the aesthetic of Maleni trash and I reckon you're in for a good night. Maybe so bad it's good. I might go so far as to say that this is so bad that it's good. Uh, and I don't say that too often, really. If you are in the market, unfortunately, this is your lot. And it's a shame because the print on this is terrible. There is another DVD from Shriek Collection, but they, as we've said on the channel many a time, they have been known to just copy other discs. So it might just be exactly the same as this. And there is a French DVD for import, but I can't speak on the quality of that. And to be honest, it's probably not worth the import costs. This is a film where I'd say if you saw this cheap in CEX or a charity shop, probably worth grabbing. It's just a shame that the print's so bad on it, but I reckon you're in for a good movie night with friends or family with this one. So, bad but entertaining this episode. And next episode, I oh, I don't know what to think of this film, to be honest. When I got a copy of this, I didn't know whether to burst out laughing or burst out crying at the fact that I have to watch this film. If you thought the cover for this film was angsty, just you wait. This is so early 2000s, it's painful. We're going to be looking at... Hunting Humans. Oh my god, look at that guy. Mm -hmm.